Welcome, everybody. Um, um, as the, the uh, new director of a new school of public policy, I will, um, without apology, just take one minute to plug the new school of public policy. It's called the Max Bell School of Public Policy. Um, and I think if there were to try to capture everything into a couple of very quick points, there are two things, there are two concepts that I think will permeate everything that happens at the Max Bell School. One is the idea that policy is very complex. Uh, I think this panel is a great example of a topic that is very complex, and it's not just technically complex. There are uh, political issues, communications issues, legal issues, jurisdictional issues, uh, all kinds of issues when we start talking about natural resources and the environment. But frankly, it doesn't really matter which topic you choose, whether you're thinking about tax policy or family policy or assisted dying or the legalization of cannabis and the list goes on pick any issue you want and it is way more complex than you might gather from reading the newspaper uh, and that idea is going to permeate uh, what we do at Max Bell a school of public policy and the second which is related is the idea that there is a pretty substantial disconnect uh, in my view, between the way academics think about policy and the way practitioners think about policy. So keep an eye on this space for the next hour and a half, and I think, actually plus an hour for lunch, and I think you will see that, there, that you might detect that disconnect, because this panel is a group of academics, and the panel right after lunch is nominally addressing the same broad topic, but they are three practitioners. So just take a look and keep some notes and see if you can see and detect the different way that academics think about these issues uh, relative to the way practitioners think about these issues. Those two ideas are going to permeate everything we do at the Max Bell School of Public Policy. Uh, a bit of shameless advertising, somewhere up there you probably saw this brochure. This is the brochure for our brand new Master of Public Policy program that embraces those two ideas. The idea of policy complexity is built very much into the program, but also trying to bridge the disconnect between academic policy thinkers and pra practical, uh, in the trenches policy thinkers. So that's enough advertising for the Max Bell School. Uh, this policy topic is complex. So natural resources and the environment is not something that we can kind of nail in 60 minutes and then break for lunch. Uh, if you've been reading the newspaper or unless you're living under a rock, you will notice that there's lots of discussion in this country about natural resources and the environment and the many things that make it complex. So we've got three great people to talk about this today. We've got Tracy Snodden on my right, who's from Wilfrid Laurier University, Jen Winter on my left, who's from University of Calgary uh, School of Public Policy. I don't usually like to talk about competing schools of public policy, but the University of Calgary School of Public Policy is a fine institution, and Martin Papillon from University of Montreal. These three individuals, and you can read their bios in the, uh, in the brochure here, but these three individuals are talking about different, or have been thinking about different aspects of this overall topic. So let me just tell you how we're gonna do it. Um, I'm gonna start with Tracy, and I'm gonna move in this direction, and I'm gonna ask each of them to give you a very brief, uh, high-level, view of what they think is super important in this overall topic. Uh, very brief, one minute each, and then you'll have a pretty good sense of what's coming in the next 75 minutes. And then we're going to go back and we're going to talk about Tracy's idea for about 15 minutes, and then Jen's, and then Martin's. Okay? That's, and then we're going to have questions from the floor. So, Tracy, take it away. Okay. Um, Thanks, Chris. Uh, he just finished saying that we can't talk about it in an hour, and I have a minute to give you my high-level overview. You are more than up to it. So um, the way I see the shifting political landscape right now, and the, that's been going on for maybe the past year or two, and as we move forward, there is a shift in the political dialogue that is drawing attention or focusing attention on some calls to action or policy reforms that perhaps are what I think misguided. So you'll hear, we need a equalization referendum, we need to no carbon tax, eliminate carbon pricing policies. But um, if we think about natural resource-based provinces, 
those policies, the equalization and carbon pricing, don't necessarily, eliminating them or changing them, doesn't necessarily address the problems that are foremost in those provinces' mind. Access to markets, uh, oil and gas price volatility, eliminating equalization is not going to affect that, or reforming equalization is not going to affect that. Higher unemployment, uh, softer provincial finances. So by shifting the dialogue, in, it's, sort of, it's a bit misguided and I think is a bit of a danger for future federal provincial um, discussions and policy making as we move forward. All right, so if intergovernmental financial transfers is the wrong focus, then when we come back to Tracy, she'll tell us what the right focus is. Jen. Okay, um, so I see sort of our current discussion in, in Canada about natural resources and the environment as a function of an evolution of values about uh, policy objectives and political objectives and sort of the trade-offs between different policy and political objectives. So we're talking about economic imperatives, environmental imperatives, um, getting re-elected for politicians. Um, security and, and social impacts. And, you know, <clears throat> regardless of where you sit on the political spectrum, these, uh, these policy objectives, um, and that's either support for the status quo or a desire for change, it falls out of some values that people hold. And that's what, it's essentially a view of what the world should be and an idea of how to get there. And I think this uh, ties back into the first panel this morning is it's becoming increasingly polarized in that people are, are not necessarily willing to accept that the view of the world and or the values that other people hold are are valid and I think that's um, that that's where we are right now and I find that particularly troubling okay thank you Martin thanks Chris um, thanks to the uh, Institute of uh, Canadian Studies at Miguel for inviting me thanks Daniel um, I'll do my pitch in French I'll switch back to English uh, for the discussion, and if I'm in trouble, I'll switch back to French again. Uh, alors, euh, ce, que, ce que moi j'aimerais souligner, c'est, euh, bon, je viens, tout d'abord, euh, euh, un petit avertissement, je ne viens pas du domaine des politiques, je ne suis pas un expert des politiques énergétiques ou environnementales, je viens plutôt du domaine des relations intergouvernementales, fédéralistes, mais plus particulièrement des questions autochtones. Donc, mon intervention va évidemment être teintée par, euh, par ce, ce, cette ce, C'est la couleur que je souhaite donner un peu à mon intervention. Euh, ce que j'aimerais souligner, je crois, c'est euh, en matière de, de, de politique énergétique, de transition énergétique, il y a des choix importants qui sont à faire. Et il me semble qu'on a au Canada, ce n'est pas unique au Canada, mais c'est particulièrement vrai au Canada, je crois, euh, des enjeux par rapport à euh, la, la légitimité du pouvoir et l'autorité. Qui a l'autorité, qui a la capacité d'agir et comment? Évidemment, ce n'est pas une question nouvelle dans la fédération, euh, mais euh, euh, ce que j'aimerais souligner aussi dans mon intervention, c'est que cette question de légitimité et d'autorité, elle renvoie à une dynamique fédérale provinciale qui n'est pas nouvelle, mais elle renvoie aussi à une autre dynamique qu'on sous-estime, ou en tout cas qu'on sous-estime de moins en moins, parce qu'on a de moins en moins le choix de la sous-estimer, et c'est celle de la légitimité de nos décisions, et aussi de l'autorité de prendre des décisions par rapport à l'affirmation de l'autorité autochtone sur le territoire, l'affirmation des peuples autochtones sur le territoire, qui, euh, de plus en plus, ce n'est pas une question nouvelle, en fait, c'est une question qui est plus vieille que la fédération, mais c'est une question qui, à mon sens, euh, euh, vient teinter toute notre capacité à prendre des décisions collectives sur les priorités, que ce soit en matière d'oléoduc, que ce soit en matière de euh, transition énergétique et autres. Et je vais essayer de développer un peu cette, euh, cet angle-là. OK, thank you, Martin. OK, wonderful. So, each one of those, if we were to spend a bunch of time on each one of these issues, I think you would see that it is complex. Uh, intergovernmental financial transfers and whether they're appropriate and whether they're the right or the wrong focus. Uh, the polarization of the political landscape and the trade-off between economic and environmental issues, as Jen talked about. And then power sharing. 
whether it's FedProv that we heard about yesterday from Jean Charest and Christy Clark, or whether it's those uh, sharing governments and having respectful uh, engagement with Indigenous and dealing with Indigenous claims, those are both actually age-old issues in this country. So just bring them all together because in any question in this country about natural resources and the environment, all three of those things get squished together. So you've got complexity cubed. So let's Let's come back and let's start with Tracy. And what we'll do is we'll just ask her for another uh, a, a statement about this and possibly where the right focus should be. And then we'll just open it up to a conversation up here. Okay, so I think I have two minutes for this round. Um, so keep in mind, I'm, I'll start with uh, the observation about equalization and, and the carbon tax or carbon pricing. Those policies have specific objectives. Equalization's objective is to um, bring uh, provinces with below average revenue raising capacity up to some standard, and carbon pricing has an environmental objective. Um, then we come to natural resource uh, based provinces and some of their concerns and their current economic issues that they're confronting um, that I mentioned in my one minute uh, um, blurb. Uh, so what are the, the things that will help address those concerns about oil and price gas volatility, uh, access to markets? So we should be perhaps focusing, the political and economic dialogue should focus on the business investment climate, not just for oil and gas, but more broadly. We should be focusing on, focusing on competitiveness and, and things that we can do to um, address competitiveness issues. We should be focusing on how to address economic uncertainty in the business uh, investment environment. We should be focusing on how to achieve access to markets and how to marry that with our environmental objectives. All of those issues um, require uh, effective and cooperation between federal and provincial counterparts. So um, having conflictual FedProv relations is, is in many senses counterproductive and it's not going to achieve, um, tick those boxes that we need to tick to address those economic concerns. Christy Clark yesterday said that um, Albertans aren't opposed to equalization. They're happy with equalization, but what they're opposed to is the notion that they are very much a have province, uh, that those resources are flowing to the have not provinces and they're not getting a pipeline built. And is that legitimate in your view to, for Albertans to say we're okay with equalization but at least don't block our pipeline, whether they're talking to BC or Quebec for that matter, or New Brunswick? So it's, it, access to markets and the pipeline is a legitimate provincial concern and um, you know, I think Alberta is trying to lever whatever political um, capital it has to sort of raise issues. Well, we do this for Quebec and, and other equalization recipient provinces. But equalization is a, is a federal program, as we heard yesterday. Um, I think um, it's not taking money directly from Alberta and giving it to other provinces, um, although federal tax money comes from all the provinces. So, um, is it legitimate? It's, it's, you know, it's part of a political strategy, but I think it, it focuses attention on the wrong thing. Right. Okay, Jen? Yeah, so uh, as the Albertan on the, on the panel, I, I think, um, you know, there is just a fundamental misunderstanding of what equalization is and for, for most people. And of course, because you know it, it's it's like many things in Canada and like many policy um, programs, it's complex. And 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 so, you know, frankly, most people have better things to spend their time on than actually understanding what equalization is and how it works. I mean, present company accepted, of course. <laughs> yeah, one of the country's experts right here on uh, <laughs> equalization, and he spent a lot of his life doing it. But. Um, so you know, it, there there's just a, a lack of understanding, and then and then it becomes a a hot button issue, and then it you know it in in some ways it reinforces um, a sense of 
injury and isolationism in Alberta and in, in, in the West, which is, you know, for better or worse there because of, you know, a lot of wacky things that have happened in Canadian history. And then it becomes um, an easy thing for politicians to talk about and in like essentially to lie or if not lie deliberately, then absolutely mislead the public about what's going to happen. I mean, the, the, the fact that provincial politicians want to have referendums on equalization, it makes no sense, but it's, it's still a talking point. Martin? <clears throat> yeah, um, I'm wondering, it, I mean, this, this, these, these, these intergovernmental tensions and these you know, misguided policies, if we, so to speak, that are driven perhaps more by politics than by sound policy uh, analysis or policy solutions. Uh, I mean, they're, I, I, it's not unique to Canada, but I'm just wondering to what extent our, our federal system is exacerbating this or not. Um, and in a way, I'm, I'm thinking also of the role of the federal, the responsibility of federal government in producing that. Because it strikes me, I, and I, I, I say this being fairly new to the world of energy policy, but it strikes me that the, the federal government is, has, been, has been playing a bit of a clientelistic policy, politics role in, 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 in that energy, in a, a regional clientelism in, the, in that area quite a lot. With the pipeline, I think it's quite obvious. It's like trading carbon tax for, for a pipeline. Uh, and, and not having been able to articulate a kind of and I hate to use national vision because it's so loaded, but uh, a kind of national narrative on these things that makes sense beyond the kind of trading, I'm going to trade you this against this, you're going to accept a pipeline and exchange, I'm gonna do. It's this kind of approach rather than a, than a, a broader view. So to what extent this, this federal uh, approach or attitude isn't exacerbating that kind of a political. Uh, so let me ask on that question, because that connects also to something that Christy Clark said yesterday. Christy Clark said that uh, the feds need to actually take more action to help the TMX pipeline get built. Mm -hmm. Now, one could respond by saying they bought the pipeline. Like, what more do you want? Uh, but some people, I think, would say, well, they, it's not enough to buy it. You've actually got to drive it through, and, you know, and, and I'm not the legal expert or the constitutional expert to know what they have to do. But is it legitimate to say to any of you, is it legitimate, you know, what's your response to the Christy Clark comment that the feds actually need to do more on that file? Quite apart from whether you agree with the pipeline or not, right? Can the feds do more on that file? So, you know, I, uh, I really enjoyed the exchange yesterday between Chris, Christy Clark and Jean Charest. That was very um, interesting and, and informative. Um, and it, what particularly resonated with me was the discussion of national interest and um, the whole purpose of having a, a, a federal government with, which job is to protect or um, develop the national interest. And that includes things that spill over borders. So um, infrastructure projects spill over borders. Um, protecting the economic uh, union, the national economic union, so that we have uh, productive labor and capital mobility and so on. So um, the pipeline fits squarely into that national interest um, file and or objective. And you know, when we have uh, 10 provinces and three territories acting in their own interests of their own citizens, those interests do not always align. The provincial interest is not always aligned with the national interest, and the federal government's job is, I think, to balance those issues. So Jean Charest, and you want to jump in on this topic, that's fine, but let me also just add this, because Jean Charest yesterday said that it would be better if our provincial premiers were more federalist. And I think he meant that as a statement across all provinces. So do you want to respond to either that or, or the Fed and the pipeline issue? Martin? Do you want to go okay, there? Jen? Okay. Sorry, I don't want to <laughs> jump in. <laughs> jump in. <laughs> Just be um, polite here. <laughs> I, I think uh, I'll, I'll make two points. Um, on, the, on the pipeline issue, it's 
Could the federal government do more? Yes, of course. I mean, they could just, as far as I'm aware, they can just declare the pipeline in the national interest and then sweep all of the additional NEB work away. Um, I think that is an option. It's essentially like legislating that we have to have this pipeline. That doesn't solve the bigger, broader, more complex issues associated with building a pipeline. And I, I think, frankly, if they did that, it would probably lead to more polarization. On the federalism issue and, and how provinces behave and how provincial governments behave, it's always good politics to blame Ottawa for something. And I think it, that is really hard to escape. In, in, in Canada, and yes, it'd be nice if premiers didn't do it and if provincial governments didn't do it, but I, I don't know if they're, like, given our current state of the world, I don't know if we're going to get there anytime soon. I think Jean Charest would say that being a federalist is completely consistent with bashing Ottawa when necessary. Uh, but federalist, in his view, was about <laughs> taking the national vision and the national interest vision and knowing that you're one piece of a broader puzzle. I'm born and raised in Edmonton, and so I was thinking about Peter Lougheed as I was listening to Jean Charest talk about that. Martin? Um, I, I, I don't want to over-interpret what Jean Charest said last, last, yesterday, so um, please bear with me, but I suspect that what he meant, and those who know him better may, may want to add to this in the conversation. Uh, I'm not sure what he meant is the fe being federalist means having the national, the national interest in mind. It's, instead, it's, a, it's having in mind the fact that in a federation, there's probably more than one national interest. Mm -hmm. And so being a federalist is being aware of that. And so it plays into, so it means being a federalist when you're at the federal government, it means having in mind that you're not the only representative of the Canadian interest, but uh, being in a province, it also means that your provincial interest is not, it's not just the Ottawa, your province kind of dynamic. There's 10 provinces and three territories that also have, and I would also argue indigenous jurisdiction as well, that have their own national interests. Quote unquote. So I think that I think that's the way he meant it, but I, maybe not. I, I might be wrong. Uh, I just and just on just quickly to add on this idea and to reinforce this. I mean, defining the national interest on things like pipeline and energy policy is a is a political question. I mean, Christy Clark defined the national interest as paying for health care. Hence, we need a pipeline. Is that the national interest? It's perhaps in the national interest. Maybe it's a good thing, but it's something we need that needs to be debated, that needs to be politically, uh, it's, it's a political struggle to define that na national interest. Because other people would argue that the national interest is to focus on, uh, on energy transition. And you know, in climate change, it's not, it is far more important and would trump like any kind of economic development right now. And other people would probably disagree with this, fair enough, but that's a debate. And so, uh, Call, uh, that's why I always resist this idea of calling, making decisions on behalf of the national interest before we've actually debated what is the national interest. And I think that one problem we've had with pipelines, and this comes back to my issue of legitimacy and political authority, is that we haven't been able to do that debate. You know, we've made decisions on the go for uh, political reasons and complex reasons that are understandable, but I think it's a problem as well. That's a great point. I mean, I think there are, I'm sure there are premiers out there who wrap up something in the provincial interest as the national interest, just as there are businesses that ramp, wrap up their private interest as something that's clearly in the national interest. So having a good discussion about what is the national interest uh, is a great one, and you've got something to say about that, I Tracy. do, I do, yes. Um, so, you know, I'm an economist, so part of me, when I think about the national interest, I think about the, the national economy and what makes the national economy function more efficiently. Um, so when we think about trade barriers and um, barriers to labor mobility across the country, though that's a national interest, keeping the economy functioning in, an in a more efficient way. When we think about um, preventing uh, tax competition or, or minimizing tax competition across provinces. I think about that as being sort of an issue that's in the na national interest. So I define national interest in my head uh, more like 
things that spill over provincial borders that the federal government needs to be involved in. And that includes when we think about greenhouse gas emissions and the inability for you know, a single province to, to tackle that on their own in some ways, um, that's, that's also part of the federal government's role. Final word before we're actually going to go on to a different speaker and a different set of issues, uh, but we could spend all day on this one, uh, is that the, the greenhouse gas emissions, I mean, as you probably know, uh, the appropriate jurisdiction and the appropriate uh, power sharing, if you like, is being debated now between provincial and federal governments with Saskatchewan's court case and Ontario's impending court case against the federal government. And it's not a slam dunk. It's not immediately obvious when you get into the constitutional details about what precise argument you're going to use to actually either try to establish that regulating greenhouse gas emissions is a pure provincial jurisdiction or whether it is in fact a federal jurisdiction, purely federal ju jurisdiction, or whether it's a shared jurisdiction. And so that battle is being fought now uh, and we will hear the results of that uh, in due course. I'm going to switch over to Martin Papillon now to come back to his, um, to his theme and then we'll spend another 10 or 15 minutes on that. Thanks. So, um, well, in fact, it sort of ties in very well because my, as I said, my, my to what I wanted to raise or what I want to raise is the issue of authority and legitimacy in, in those debates. And I, I had kind of two, two aspects to this. One is the authority and legitimacy in terms of FedProv uh, relations, which we've already talked about. So I'm, I'm tempted to sort of um, let that go and we can continue the conversation on this uh, more. But I'll, I, maybe I'll just use my time to uh, uh, expand a bit more on the other one, which is the issue of uh, uh, the issue of jurisdiction and legitimacy as it pertains to indigenous people. And I'm focusing here probably a little more on, on energy policy and, and pipeline and mines and so on and so forth, more than on the environmental aspect. But uh, there's, there's some relevance here as well. So, uh, we, I mean, we've taken for granted for 150 years and more in Canada that, you know, there's, there's two, two jurisdictions in Canada, uh, which is, you know, arguably a, a, a political construct, but there is the, the fact of indigenous authority and jurisdiction on the land is, predates the Federation. And what we're seeing, and this has been recognized uh, by politicians, by governments, by the courts, uh, and by international bodies as well. Uh, it's not something that I'm making up today. Um, so, uh, and, but what we're seeing in recent years is a, a growing legal and political recognition of this reality. Um, some are saying it's not going fast enough. Uh, and that reconciliation requires far more structural change to our federation than what we're willing to admit right now, and it's probably true. But the changes are nonetheless substantive and they've happened. And I, just to be a bit provocative, I would say that it is now and will be increasingly difficult for a provincial government or a federal government to push through a pipeline, a mine, or a hydroelectric project without the support, consent of the indigenous people that are affected by them, the, the, whose lands are affected. And I think our system hasn't quite clicked on this yet. And the, uh, the Trans Mountain debacle <laughs> is a very good example of this. I mean, we focus on the FedProv battle on this, mm -hmm. but the real sticking point for the pipeline is not BC, I don't think. I mean, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't, I don't think it's BC. I think it's in indigenous people. And the courts have said that repeatedly. And the Federal Court of Appeal, in its decision to quash the, the permit for, the, um, for the, uh, the pipeline last year, uh, basically said the problem, I mean, there's part of the environmental assessment was flawed, but the, the bigger problem was that the process for decision for authorizing the, pro, uh, the project didn't respect, did, was not consistent with Canada's constitutional obligation in terms of consultation with indigenous people. And what the Federal Court of Appeal said is, it's more, you, you can't just take notes and take into consideration Aboriginal interest. You actually have to accommodate them and make sure that they are fully taken into consideration in the decision-making process. We can debate what that means, uh, but what, from the perspective of indigenous people, that what that means is our decision-making authority and our legitimacy has to be respected. And so what we need, I think, is processes that allow this. Un otherwise, these conflicts are going to be ongoing and we'll never be able to build, whether or not we agree with these pipelines, we'll never able, be able to build them. 
So I can go in details about the, the how and why, but I think I can leave that to okay, discussion. Okay, great. So l let, me, let me ask, I guess, a clarifying question on that, because you talked about you know, it's the virtual impossibility of a province now you know, doing a major project without Indigenous consent. So is it consent that is required, or is it genuine, respectful consultation that is required, because those are different things. And if it is consent, then how do you deal with the fact that um, indigenous uh, people or nations don't speak with a single voice? So you see this on the TMX pipeline, mm -hmm. where there are some indigenous groups that are in favor, and there are some indigenous groups that are opposed. So what do you do? Mm -hmm. So how, can you just wrap that up neatly in, you know, <laughs> nope. 60 seconds? <laughs> no. <laughs> If I could, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> uh, no, I, uh, it, good, excellent questions. On the consent consultation stuff, I mean, legally, uh, in Canada, strictly speaking, it's consultation, enhanced cons consultation when there's a title at stake, and then, uh, depending, you know, there's, there's a technicality, but there's a, you know, it's a scope on the, on the level of consultation. Uh, but at, I think ethically and arguably in terms of inter Canada being consistent with its international obligation, uh, consent is becoming more and more the, the thing, right? The expectation from Indigenous people. Uh, and because consent is connected with jurisdiction, quite frankly. Uh, and that's the reason why. Because consultation, being consultant and being decision maker is not the same. And the real claim of Indigenous people is to be decision makers. And so that allows me to tie into your second thing, which is how we do this. There's disagreements within indigenous people, obviously. It's not surprising, like every society, right? Uh, it's not a monolithic block. Uh, so what we need is processes to have these, conver these discussions, right? So rather than having a process that is imposed to indigenous people where we ask them, oh, hey, what do you think of this pipeline? You don't agree? Well, OK, at least we consulted you, which is essentially what's happening right now. If we bring in indigenous people into the decision-making process with their divisions, right, uh, then it becomes possible. And there are examples of this right now in Canada. I'm not crazy when I say that. There are examples of this in Canada. There are examples in BC, in fisheries that are developing right now. Uh, there's a really good number of examples are in BC for political and legal reasons, but they're not unique to BC. There are interesting examples of collaborative co-decision making in Northern Quebec with the James Bay Decree. Um, there are examples elsewhere. So this is not something I'm making out of nowhere. It exists. It's just not fully recognized, and it's not part of our DNA to think in those terms, I think. I like when Martin says, uh, I'm not crazy when I say that. I go around this country talking a lot about carbon pricing, and I, I feel I'm going to start adopting that. I'm not crazy <laughs> when I say this. Tracy, yes. what do you think about what you just heard from Martin? Um, well, I'd just like to focus a little bit on the um, you know, the, the evolution or the process of the consultation and, and bringing in indigenous um, groups into the, the real conversations. And you're saying that, that the, the process is not fast enough, but progress has been made. And, um, you know, that, that resonates with me and, and it's typical of the way things are done in Canada because um, cooperation and coordination and harmonization and dialogue and anything that crosses borders in Canada or groups has, has always taken a long time. And so, you know, I'm a, a student of fiscal federalism and, and we think about tax coordination, <sighs> took years. You know, it's still an ongoing process when we think about the GST and the HST. So, you know, that evolutionary process is, is how things get done in Canada. And, and things do get done. It is a slow process. It often takes what I, um, I adopt language from Tom Kershane called sweeteners, you know, that help facilitate the process along. But it, I mean, the process does evolve. So, you know, I'm, I, I'm erring on the side of being optimistic. I'm, I'm optimistic. Jen, are you optimistic? Uh, y yes and no, which is a perfect academic answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have to address that. You can, you can say anything you want here. Okay. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, no, we're very open to ideas here. At okay. Okay. So I, I think uh, <laughs> our, um, our, one of our biggest failings as a country is the fact that what is uh, adequate consultation is being decided by the courts rather than between Indigenous peoples and different levels of governments. And you think about what is good for Canada, what is good for all peoples in Canada, 
what is good for the economy. It is not having decisions about infrastructure projects put through a court system in terms of what a waste of resources for the project proponents, for governments, for indigenous peoples. And I mean, the, the fact that this is how it's happening is just, you know, like really, really sad to, you know, to, to, to say the least. Um, so, so that's my, my pessimistic side. I think it is, you know, it, it, we are iterating towards what is uh, appropriate consultation. And as, as Martin said, we have examples of good processes where there is joint decision making. And I think that is, um, that is positive for Canada. The, the problem is that it's just like, you know, it, it, it's too slow and Maybe it's partly that 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 governments are risk averse, but in in, in terms of like fully engaging with uh, with indigenous peoples, and that it's in it could be in in many ways it's safer to let the courts lay out what it should be. That I mean that that's that's a, that's a, a tough thing to to watch. Um, and so, you know, okay, so let yeah. me come back to your pessimism because yeah. the, the pessimism that mm -hmm. if basically what's standing in the way, one of the major things that's standing in the way of major natural resource investment projects is that these decisions are getting made by courts. Mm -hmm. This is something actually that Tracy raised about, uh, about the, business, the investment business environment mm -hmm. uh, and market access in some cases. But so if we if we accept the idea that there is a power sharing issue that needs to be resolved and that we have courts to do that but we also accept the idea that that we need a better business environment in which there is greater certainty for potential investors of big big projects that are in the national economic interest how do we square that circle like how do we use the the law and the courts the appropriate amount but try to get as much business certainty as we can. Open question for all of you. Martin. Well, I, I, I can jump in because it ties into the question of the courts. I think, um, you know, the, we're seeing, <clears throat> especially in British Columbia because of the unsettled title issue, but it's also true elsewhere in the country, I think, and in, to a certain extent in, in Quebec as well. Uh, we're, we're seeing uh, governments, but also project proponents and uh, uh, economic actors seeing the interest in preventing that legal uncertainty, preventing the risk of going to court and stalling the project by engaging with indigenous communities from the outset earlier on. This is what the courts have been telling us for, for years, right? Engage, negotiate, uh, collaborate before you go to court. And so we're seeing this. So yeah, so I, I, I agree that the process is slow, but it's, it's happening, you know, and we're learning. And, and I think that the shift from a legal obligation and political and ethical imperative to an actual economic one is happening. I mean, we're seeing it now. There is no interest in anyone ignoring indigenous people anymore. There's no economic interest in doing that, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so my answer to your question, I think, is partly that it, I, in a way the market is doing it, you know, right. because it's creating so much uncertainty and the cost of that uncertainty is so high that you know the, the mechanisms are emerging. I'm not sure it's enough, and I'm not sure the mechanisms that are emerging through market, which is you know private agreements between companies and in, indigenous in communities, is the best way to do that. We can get into a debate about this, but I mean at least there are things that are that are happening that are kind of correcting that. Good. Okay, yeah. Jan and then Tracy. Um, I don't know. Do you want me to be more optimistic? Either. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I so. Um, there are examples of, of where, like, say, the, f the federal government or the provinces can move to in it to, be, to be better at this. And, and these are not just international examples. There are examples within Canada. I think modern treaties, especially in the territories, are a good example of co-governance. And um, I think the territories are a particularly interesting example because I think generally speaking, they are perhaps, they don't have the same angst about uh, fossil fuel development that we do in, in, in southern Canada because of 
their their actual concern about um, the effects of energy use, say like diesel for heating and electrification, and wanting to move away from those energy sources because of climate change and because of, of, of carbon taxes and and. Um, so I think, and, and so that's an example of where there are really substantial economic and climate benefits from energy development that I think most people aren't necessarily aware of. And, and so we can, I mean, we, there are positives and, 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 and good ways to go forward within Canada and it would, you know, it, as part of reconciliation we could probably all learn a lot more about what this should look like. Okay, final word from you, Tracy, before we move on to the next period. Well, um, you know, one, one concern I have is uh, I do think there are benefits from energy and, and, and energy infrastructure development, and there's, there's climate benefits that we can um, pair with that, and there's, and there's economic benefits, but, you know, um, not everybody is a winner. And, you know, I sometimes think that, that it might not be possible such that everybody wins and that, that, that we have to be prepared to think about how we address people who are not going to win under those policies because I think it's, it's um, I'm, I tend to be an optimist, but I think it's, you know, the economist in me says that, you know, there are going to be winners and there are going to be losers and I think we have to acknowledge who's going to lose, and how we're going to address their, their concerns. And I'm a little more pessimistic on the path for doing that. Yeah. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit, and we're going to go to our third topic, which is gin, uh, which is a, I was going to say it's a more political topic, although I'm not sure that's possible based on what we've just been talking about. But uh, over to you. Okay, so so Tracy's comment is a perfect segue for me because I, I think like any any policy decision involves trade-offs and winners and losers, and all too often the uh, the political discussion is not willing to admit that there are these trade-offs, and I think that plays into the issue of, of polarization of um, natural resource development, of pipelines, of carbon taxes, is there isn't an acknowledgement of these trade-offs, and that's at the political level, where um, certain parties will say that uh, car carbon prices don't work, or they're just a tax grab, or you know, on, on the, the the other side that um, there's uh, n no economic costs associated with carbon pricing. There are, they're obvious. That's part of the problem. The revenues are also part of the benefit. But like, and, and so like that's it's about the the framing, and then at the um, individual voter level, the, the polarization is from just, um, you know, in, I would say in many ways, just a little bit of disenfranchisement in that the decisions that politicians are making are not representative of the ones that I would make or that Chris would make, and so that makes us grumpy, or in some cases, angry. And then, it, it, like, it, it snowballs. Um, so Alberta has um, a, an election coming up, and one of the things I found interesting is like uh, driving to the airport, listening to a CBC um, at noon call-in show and recognizing that it is a certain subset of the population that listens to CBC at noon and calls in to CBC at noon. There was a discussion of uh, like meeting someone who will fight for Alberta. And I think that perfectly encapsulates sort of the, the tone of politics across Canada right now in that it's, we're in a, an era of uncooperative federalism and the idea is that we, we need leaders who are very, very pro for their province and are willing to fight. Um, and you know, that's not necessarily the way to get um, policy 
um, advanced because there are trade-offs and in order to advance policy we need to have a discussion of those trade-offs and, and there needs to be compromise and so we're not necessarily seeing that. So there's always been tough decisions to make in this country. There have always been trade-offs. There's always been winners and losers. Um, and there's probably always been some political polarization, although we might believe uh, that it's more polarized now. But what's the solution? So if you've, got, if you've got complex policy issues that you need to think through and that we need to debate, um, and we live in a polarized environment, then what, like, what do we do? Martin, do we, or Jen, if you wanna give a quick response to that? Policy schools. <laughs> you know, I didn't pay her to say that. Um, she, policy no, schools, I love it. She didn't it. say Max Bell. <laughs> That's okay. I'll, I'll, I'm, uh, I'm quite prepared to do the competition. Um, okay, policy schools. That's good. We can all agree that the federal government should uh, subsidize policy schools across the country. Can we take a quick vote on that? Yep, 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 yep. Good. All right. Sorry? Se Oh, it's fine. I'm okay. I'm, you know, I'm okay with any color of money. Federal, provincial, it's all good. It's all good. Uh, Martin? Uh, yeah. Serious question, though. Well, I mean, how do, we, how do we conduct policy debates? How do we push through good policy ideas? How do we discover good policy ideas in a polarized environment? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not sure the, the, the problem is the lack of policy ideas. I mean, there's very good public policy schools in Canada. Uh, the, the problem, I, I, so I'm not sure the problem is there. It's not the lack of ideas. It's the, how you translate these ideas into viable pol political options mm -hmm. that is more complex. I think that, the, and this is perhaps reflect, I mean, as academics, it's easy to say we need good ideas. We need good, rational, sound policy. But of course, I mean, when, you, when you're faced with the politics, the reality, then, then that, that doesn't necessarily translate. So my, my concern is more, I think, picking up on what you said, is that the climate is not conducive to good policy ideas emerging and being picked up, and that uh, that reflects what Tracy was uh, was saying uh, from the beginning. But I, I mean, uh, one one way to to think of it is that again we tend we tend to think of these things as zero sums. There's winners and losers, and it's true. Uh, but but politics is also about you know, how you d distribute the winners and losers so that it's not always the same people that are the winners and not always mm. the same people that are losers. And, and, and again, we haven't been really good at this. And I think that's, you know, if the, perhaps it's less the substance of the policy, but how we go about, you know, the carbon pricing, if, if you do it in a way that people will see this as a legitimate national project, then it's easier to lose on bits of it if you know that you're gaining on another part of it. And we haven't been able to articulate that politically. Tracy, and maybe also address, is trust an issue or mistrust of, of our governments in these discussions and the polarization? Um, I, I certainly think mistrust is, a, is an issue and, and you know, some of the discussion in the media and by the politicians themselves contribute to that mistrust. It sort of fosters uh, discontent and, and lack of trust or don't believe in, in, in so-and-so. Um, you know, if I, if I think about what we need to do to have uh, good policy solutions to complex problems, you know, I come back to we need more dialogue that's focused on real, the reality of the situation, the costs, the benefits, you know, that is informed dialogue. And, and you know, it can start at the, with all the major players, but federal provincial dialogue, in some sense, you know, it goes up and down and um, it needs to go up. <laughs> More dialogue. And, you know, three years ago, no, two, what, 2019, let's say 2016, there was a, just um, political colors aligned such that more dialogue, I think, was happening, at least engagement. Not everybody agrees, but reasonable people are discussing. Um, and I think that we've, that's fallen off a bit. So I think more dialogue is required to tackle those complex issues. Okay, um, we're gonna open it up 
very shortly to questions from the audience, because I think there are going to be some. But I'm going to ask each of you to say a final word. And I am inviting you to make it provocative so that we can increase the number of people that want to ask a question. So try to say something outrageous. Jen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's Doesn't not have fair. to be outrageous. Um, final word. Um, final word. Final word. Outrageous or not? Outrageous. Can I just say provocative? Yeah, absolutely. Provocative <laughs> no, is good. I'll, I like provocative. I'll, I'll say something. Uh, say something reasonable. Um, I think at, at the risk of sounding a, a little bit trite, um, we in order to increase dialogue and also to have more options on the table and more discussions of trade-offs, I really do think we need more academics engaging with the, the public, talking to the media, talking to politicians, you know, volunteering our time in, say, knowledge mobilization and knowledge translation outside of academia. I, it's... Um, there are, like taking the example of, of carbon pricing uh, in Alberta, there are three or four of us who are fighting the, the uphill battle of explaining some fairly complex issues to the public. And, um, you know, it, it can be tiring, it can be exhausting, and it can also be a little bit disconcerting because you, you, you get a, a lot of... Um, negative negative reaction and and so th the more people that are willing to the more academics that are actually willing to step outside their comfort zone and be out there talking about these issues i think that creates the space within the political sphere to um, you know open up options that might not necessarily be there with without um, academics putting themselves out there good martin uh, I don't want to repeat myself, but I'm, I, I will. I think that the, <laughs> the, um, the energy transition that we're undergoing requires strong leadership, and we're at a time where, you know, it, in legitimacy-wise and authority-wise, it's, it's not obvious to find it. And top-bottom solution, there's a tension, right? You, you need strong leadership, but top-bottom solutions are not viable. So it's this, it's this tension that I see, that I find, it's not provocative, it's just a problem that I find big. <laughs> okay, Tracy? Okay, I'm gonna focus on Alberta and Alberta's um, provincial finances when it comes to oil and gas revenue volatility. Um, that some options for Alberta to think about and rather than if a new government is formed, el eliminating the carbon climate policy, I would argue that greenhouse gases are a pretty good, steady revenue source. So they should not give that up. They should keep that and use it for good purposes. Um, and the second is that Alberta could ease some of its uh, volatility by introducing a sales tax, which is a very reliable source of, stable source of revenue. That's hardly provocative in Alberta, eh? Yeah. Um, Just a little bit. I, I love I used it. to live I love in it. Alberta, so I, I know it. it's provocative. <laughs> Every good economist I know actually says something like that. I want to come back. Okay, so we're ready for questions except this. I want to come back and underline. It's interesting what Jen said about... Uh, so she said she was going to say something provocative. Uh, now, I don't know how many academics there are in the room versus what I would call, let's say, normal people, okay? But what Jen said is that academics should play a bigger role in speaking about policy outside of the gates of their university. That's what she said. That is not a controversial statement outside of any university. Normal people think that what she said should be going on. In fact, normal people think it is going on. It's amazing that it's a controversial statement within a university. It is amazing to me how many academics either do not care about policy, and that's okay, they can care about other things, but even the ones that actually are doing research on policy issues don't then take that next step and speak outside of their academic walls, and they don't speak to 
elected officials or unelected officials or the press or anybody that wants to talk about policy. And so it actually is uh, within the walls of the university. It's a fairly controversial thing, but I think I completely agree with Jen that we need more academics who are taking their ideas because they actually do know a lot about their own specialty. And if they don't speak about good and bad and different policy ideas, that void will be filled. And the void will be filled for the most part by snake oil salesmen. So if we don't actually step forward and talk about the complexity of real world policy, don't think that, that nothing will be said because we won't like what gets said. So on that note, let me open it up for <laughs> questions. Uh, do we have a roving microphone? Is that what's happening here? Okay, so is there only one microphone that I have to keep an eye on? Thank you, sir down on the right. Yeah, Doug Brown. Uh, I have a question, I guess mainly for Martin, but others. and. The uh, current federal government's proposal or idea of having negotiations or uh, with uh, indigenous peoples or groups about uh, ownership of the pipeline, uh, is, that a, is that what you mean when you're talking about you know, uh, working on a better distribution of, of wins and losses here? Is, so how would you evaluate the prospects for that? Thank you for the brief question that was not preceded by a comment. I appreciate that. Martin, uh, that question is for you, and uh, if the others want to jump in, just... you can, but you don't feel necessary. Sorry? So we're just, uh, we're not taking number of Let's just go one by one. Okay, sure. Uh, I like when there's many questions, because then you have time to think about your answer, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> sorry. So is... Um, <clears throat> Let, let's broaden the, the, the question, because I think it's a, it's a good one, but is the solution to uh, create opportunities for indigenous people to have a stake in resource development? Uh, and the, the, the obvious answer is yes and no. I mean, this is part of the answer, probably, in terms of benefiting from the development on their land, and this is a pretty clear, I mean, the fact that we've extracted resources from indigenous lands for centuries without redistributing the benefit is a pretty clear problem, but uh, it doesn't solve the decision-making capacity problem, which is, you know, and in, in, in the context of pipelines, particularly complex because you have a number of indigenous nations that are situated along the way that no, don't necessarily have the same opinion on the value of the pipeline based on their interests, their worldviews, or whatever. So, uh, so it, so, and that decision-making process, you cannot. Uh, I'm worried that if we only focus on the economic interest, which is what we're doing in the pipelines right now, uh, we're forgetting, we're bypassing the actual decision itself. Indigenous people are brought into or bought into accepting a pipeline without having a say in, in deciding whether this is a good thing or not. Uh, and, and, and that worries me a bit, uh, and we see that quite a bit. So. Um, Okay, I forget to ask, so I don't know how the microphone is being controlled here. Are you in control? Thank you. So can I just get a show of hands of people who, the demand for the microphone. How many people would like to ask a question? So see those hands, now we'll see where it'll go. And who's got the microphone now? Leslie Sir, Seidel. at the back right, great. Leslie Seidel at uh, IRPP here in Montreal. I want to come in on the question of the role of the courts in relation to uh, indigenous involvement, decision-making. I liked Martin's uh, observations, I'll rephrase them slightly, but uh, to the effect that we're learning as a country. We're way behind on the involvement of indigenous people. We nevertheless have a constitution that has some very important sections in it, but that leaves a lot open, notably the definition of section 35. So uh, my question is to Jen. Uh, you suggested, uh, if I heard you correctly, that uh, governments are risk adverse. Uh, yes, they often are. I spent 20 years in Ottawa working on intergovernmental affairs. You then went on to suggest, um, I believe, that they may sometimes, on purpose, leave these issues to be resolved by the courts. Are you suggesting that um, ministers and senior public servants are acting in bad faith in this very important area? No. Um, 
Not in bad faith. But I think this is clearly a, a fraught area, and it, you know, being risk averse, and I also think that you know the consequences of the wrong, the, you know, the, the wrong decision are substantive, and and have the risk of setting relationships with Indigenous peoples and reconciliation back. And so it's not necessarily bad faith. It's it's quite potentially not knowing what the appropriate step is and having courts give guidance on that is, I don't want to say easier, but safer, I guess, is, is the way I, I would characterize it. Can I just jump in? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I, I agree that leaving it to the court is problematic, but sometimes it's also necessary. Mm. I mean, if you generally don't agree on what is the duty to consult, you can negotiate forever. At some point, you need someone to decide. And we have a court system that is designed for that, right? So at some point, the fact that governments end up going to court to figure out you know, carbon pricing uh, stuff is, I mean, it, it's, it's problematic democratically if it's a systematic uh, course to court. But once in a while, it's also necessary. So I, you know, there's there's a balancing, and the, the courts have been playing a, a good role in Canada. We're lucky to have a, a court system that is, you know, uh, uh, careful uh, about is uh, its or a Supreme Court that's careful about its approach to federalism and indigenous politics as well as indigenous rights uh, as well. Where you know, there's uh, they're not they're not creating further polarization most of the time. And so we've, we've been lucky that they're, they're political in that sense, that, or they're aware of the political consequences of their decisions. And so, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't think the courts are playing a negative role at all. I Perfect. just want to okay. add okay. one in. more. Yep. I'll, I'll be quick. Um, and I think the, 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 the major issue I have with um, the duty to consult being decided by the courts is that it's not, um, it's not really a, it's a, it's in the context of specific projects, and I think a much better way to utilize, say, the court system would be to, for, for, for governments in Canada, so the, the government of Canada, provincial governments, to refer to the courts potentially, or to ask retired justices for advice on defining what duty to consult is, you know, in, in partnership with in Indigenous peoples. And I think that would be a much more effective way to approach it rather than it being cons like, you know, we're just, um, you know, little bits and pieces with each court case, with each infrastructure project. Perfect. Thank you. Where is the microphone now? Andrew Parkin. I'm Andrew. I'm the person who heckles people about Section 93 of the Constitution Act. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is mainly for Jennifer, I think, and it's just wondering if, if, if you can, if you have a sense of where the conversation is in Alberta and in the oil patch in particular about, about the time horizon of oil and gas wealth in Alberta. So if, you know, part of the, it seems to me part of the cleavage right now is in Alberta is sitting on wealth that is not being realized today and other parts or other citizens, but other parts of the country think we're transitioning to a post-carbon economy. And, you know, we, those, visions come into to, to context. But last I checked, and I'm not a geologist, but you know, there was a sense that around Fort McMurray, there's about a 20, 30 year horizon, and I could be totally wrong. But if you were governing Alberta for the long term, you would have to be also transitioning to post carbon economy, not for political reasons at all, but for geological ones. I just don't know if that's true. So the question is, does it enter in the conversation at all? Um, and the subtext of the question is, does that create possible you know, some possible ground, common ground. Uh, so, so in terms of, so Alberta has a lot of oil and gas, like a ridiculous amount of, of oil and gas. And so the time horizon is based on investment rather than the, the availability of the, the resource. Uh, so, so I think one of the, our, our, our challenges is, uh, and this is related to, to my comments about polarization, is that we really have, say, caricatures of what an Albertan is like, what a Quebecer is like, what an Ontario Ontarian is, is like, and um, 
you know, so like the caricature of Albertans is that they're all, we are all in favor of oil and gas and don't care about the environment. And um, you know, the caricature of someone from British Columbia is they're all like uh, tree hugging hippies who don't want pipelines. But I mean, like that that doesn't. Uh, that doesn't capture the nuance of the discussion. And I also think when we're talking about any sort of transition, what's important to remember is it's not carbon that's the problem. It's the emissions from combustion that are the problem. And so what we really want to try and do is maintain the economic activity and the quality of life that we enjoy, which is right now primarily fueled by fossil fuels. Um, but we want to reduce the emissions. Um, and so there is a lot of work going in to doing that in Alberta so that we can realize the value from, from those natural resources without having the environmental consequences. Thank um, you. I'm going to get Tracy to jump in on this, and then I'm going to jump in on this. <laughs> um, you know, so uh, that's a, it's a good question about how, how long, how much you know, uh, geologically do we have, and, and Jen, thanks for answering that. It's, it's a ridiculous amount that uh, we have. Um, so that, that transition process to a low carbon economy, that transition process is going to be a long, long time. Um, and, you know, so we, governments kind of sort of can't sit around and say, we're just, you know, it's going to be over soon, so we'll just you know, don't have to deal with it. So we really do have to deal with that because the, it's going to be years and years and years, decades, right? So um, I think having uh, something like carbon pricing in place allows you, provides the incentives to uh, get those em emissions reductions while you're trying to push forward the, the economic agenda, I guess. so. Um, you know, we do have an imperative to do that because the, we're, it's going to be a long time till we're at the end. I want to underline what Tracy just said about the, the speed of the transition. This is a, one of those things that I think this country needs a realistic discussion about. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would actually fault the Prime Minister for talking about a transition the way he does, almost as if it's going to be easy and relatively soon. So today in the world, and let's make the distinction about what's going on globally and what we can do within a country. Today in the world, um, we produce, we ship, and we consume 96 million barrels of oil every day. 96 million barrels of oil every day. And if you look at forecasts from the International Energy Agency or other sort of reputable places, uh, there's obviously uncertainty about those forecasts. But those forecasts show global consumption and production rising probably for the next 10 years, maybe 15 years, peaking out at something like 110 million barrels a day, uh, and then starting a long run transition down as the other energy sources really start to beat out oil in the marketplace. And you could quibble about whether that peak happens in 2030 or 2025, or, or maybe even it happens in three years from now. But what you can't quibble with is the idea that we're still at about roughly 100 million barrels of oil a day, and if we then ramp down by 80% over 50 years, we're still using a whole pile of oil for the next 50 years. So that's globally. Then you can say, well, what are we going to do in Canada and what are we going to do in Alberta? It's perfectly legitimate for Alberta to try to be supplying some of its oil to that world, and that's what it's trying to do. And so I think we really need to think about this transition as something that is slow, and we could maybe design policies that could speed it up, but it's not a transition that takes place uh, you know, in a few years. And that's why having carbon pricing in place to actually change the way we consume oil and the way we produce many things and consume oil along the way, but at the same time that you build new pipelines to get our oil that we are producing to a global market for the next 20 years might make perfect sense. And if you think I'm slightly biased in that view, that's okay. On April 10th, we'll have an event in this, not quite this room, but within 100 yards of this room, um, that is put on by the Max Bell School, which is about fighting climate change and building new pipelines, and whether those two things are coherent or whether they are crazy. 
That's what the discussion will be. April 10th, go to our website and check it out. Do we have time for one more question? I've got two questions. Well, we absolutely have time for two more questions. Of course. Uh, thank you, Chris. Ginette Lamontagne, l'Association des retraités de l'Université McGill. Ma première question est pour Martin uh, Papillon. Uh, vous avez mentionné uh, Énergie S et euh, le fait qu'il n'y a pas eu beaucoup de consultations. Moi, j'ai l'impression, en tant que citoyenne, que je n'ai pas été consultée pour Énergie S, que la question, que toute la discussion a été euh, prise de mauvaise façon. Si on m'avait dit, est-ce que vous voulez, et puis si on avait dit à n'importe quel Québécois, est-ce que vous voulez que, euh, être, que le Canada soit autosuffisant en, en production et exploitation et, et consom consommation de pétrole les gens auraient dit oui, puis ensuite, on aurait, on aurait pu voir, mais est -ce que, com comment est-ce qu'on fait cette, tra cette, euh, cette transition, etc. Alors, je trouve que de ce côté-là, il n'y a pas eu assez de débat public. Et j'ai été vraiment interloquée quand Denis Coderre a dit publiquement, euh, les Québécois sont contre, sont contre euh, en fait, les Montréalais sont contre, sont contre ça. Et... Euh, c'est seulement plus tard que j'ai compris que, en fait, les maires de la grande communauté euh, urbaine, les 82 maires, s'étaient prononcés là-dessus, qu'ils n'avaient pas sorti ça juste de son chapeau. Alors, ça, c'est euh, une question, et je vais vous laisser euh, réfléchir, en fait, un commentaire, parce que euh, j'ai l'impression que, oui, en tant que citoyenne, je n'ai pas été consultée. Uh, the other is for uh, the, the, the rest of the panel. Um, How do you untangle, I mean, yesterday we had a, a beautiful demonstration of, of a, a sort of cooperative federalism, listening to uh, Jean Charest and uh, Christy Clark uh, speak. And, um, and carbon pricing seems to me, the, you know, a very important public policy that we have to implement very soon. So how do you untangle the partisanship Uh, of uh, a Scott Moe, a Jason Kenney, a Blaine Nix, and a Doug Ford. How do you un untangle that? Okay, so two very easy uh, things <laughs> to address. Uh, so, Martin, I think you get the first one, which is consultation over Energy East, and et cetera, et cetera, and then we'll try the last one. <clears throat> Euh, merci pour la question. Les, les consultations sur Énergie Est, euh, et je me trompe peut-être, mais euh, si je ne me trompe pas, euh, n'ont jamais en fait été entièrement complétées euh, parce que le projet a été suspendu avant euh, que le processus euh, soit véritablement mis en place. Pour diverses raisons, une des raisons importantes, c'est la question de savoir qui devait procéder à l'évaluation du projet. Hein, quelles, quelles compétences le Québec ou le BAP avait dans ce projet-là? Il, il y a une chicane. La compagnie, le promoteur du projet, s'y est mal pris hein, en, en commençant, en prenant pour acquis que c'est une question fédérale, donc c'est fédéral, donc on va suivre les règles fédérales. Euh, ils avaient peut-être mal compris qu'au Québec, c'est pas comme ça que ça se passe, que c'est jamais juste une question fédérale. <rire> euh, et, euh, et donc, si je me souviens bien, je me trompe peut-être, mais il y a eu... Euh, le débat autour d'énergie Est a, a, a eu lieu, mais a eu lieu de façon assez superficielle, finalement, parce qu'on n'a jamais eu à pousser euh, jusqu'à la prise de décision. Et là, je ne parle même pas des consultations par rapport aux Autochtones qui ont, euh, qui ont à peine été... En, la, la compagnie a à peine commencé à réfléchir à ça euh, quand le projet a été euh, suspendu. Donc, vous n'avez pas été consulté. Non, je pense qu'effectivement, vous n'avez pas été consulté parce que, finalement, il n'y a, a pas eu vraiment un processus. S'il y avait eu un processus, est-ce que ces consultations-là auraient été satisfaisantes, bonnes, informées par des, euh, une, euh, un rationnel satisfaisant, peut-être pas. Euh, mais là, je pense que c'est une autre, c'est peut-être une autre question là, qui, euh, ouais, à laquelle j'ai pas la réponse. Là, parce que ce serait une euh, spéculation. So if the consultation was never quite appropriate, uh, stay tuned because it may come back. Mm -hmm. Because if the TMX doesn't get built for whatever reason, I think there will be some demand for some pipeline out of Alberta, and Energy East um, just may be the next one on the list. So the next easy question, and this will be how we'll end before we go off for lunch, uh, will be carbon pricing. So how to untangle uh, and address the polarized landscape from what Jeanette, uh, basically the names that you called out, Jeanette, were those people who showed up on the cover of McLean's magazine called The Resistance. The Resistance with a capital R to carbon pricing. So we'll have Jen and then we'll have Tracy because they've got this wrapped up. 
So at this point in time, I think those uh, or that political leadership are locked into their opposition to, to carbon pricing. In that, you know, t typically we think of conservatives being in favor of market based policies, you know, lack of government intervention. So, you know, they should be in favor of carbon pricing over uh, regulation or even, um, a, a, but the, the issue is, I think, for the, that base right now is it's a choice between um, carbon pricing or doing nothing at all. And right now, there's a preference for doing nothing at all. And w as long as that's the case, it's there, there's going to continue to be. But it's an unstated preference. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is an unstated preference. Um, and and so, like, if say Jason Kenney was elected in Alberta, is going to walk back the Alberta carbon tax, not all the way, because I think that would be. Um, it would it create additional business uh, uncertainty, but walking it back it then gets to blame the carbon tax on Ottawa. I mean, they're, they're sacrificing other things like control of the revenue, but at the same time, it just plays into the province fighting against Ottawa. And, and so, yeah, right now, it's, I, I think, new political leadership in conservative parties is what uh, what it'll be, or just people stopping to uh, care about carbon taxes. Quick comment on Alberta. One of the interesting uh, design features of the Alberta carbon tax is that a big chunk of the revenues uh, is used to finance quarterly, I think they're quarterly, checks in the mail to about the bottom two-thirds of households by income. So if Jason Kenney were to repeal the Alberta carbon tax, then unless he wants to increase the budget deficit significantly, which he could choose to do, or cut other spending, which he could choose to do, then he, there would be some pressure on him to repeal those checks in the mail. And checks in the mail, I think you would agree, are popular. So that's a challenge that he's going to face. Tracy. And I'll, just, <clears throat> I'll pick up on that because um, you know, putting the legal question aside about who has jurisdiction and what it actually, how that's going to unfold. If uh, Kenny does get elected and rolls it back and has to uh, cut back on those, those checks, the federal system kicks in and it will be the federal government sending those checks in the mail to Albertans, which, you know, right back at you. That's how that political battle is going to go. You know, I, if I think back um, to you know, how are we going to move forward? We, have, we had about a decade where some provinces were acting on, on climate policy and carbon pricing and some provinces weren't. And, you know, provinces were unable to sort of implement uh, Canada-wide carbon pricing when, when they had no mechanism for getting everybody on board. They have no mechanism at the provincial level to ratcheting up carbon pricing if we need, as we need to do in the future. Um, and so, and the federal government came in with an opportunity to say, let's all do it together. And, you know, so players have jumped ship. And so the federal government has implemented this plan. Um, and, and that's not unlike what happened with the GSD, right? And so it's, it's probably not optimal. And we don't know whether it'll survive the legal challenge. And we don't know whether it'll survive the federal election. But should it survive? Um, I think we can expect to see that um, greater on board with all the provinces and greater moving forward in a concerted way will eventually come along. It's just going to take a much longer time frame. For those people who are interested in carbon pricing and they're interested in the polarization that Jen talked about and the question that Jeanette asked, uh, the Ecofiscal Commission, which I chair, has a report coming out that Danielle mentioned. It's coming out on Monday. Uh, you can go to ecofiscal.ca to check it out. But this report is all about slaying the myths 
that are currently in the carbon pricing debate. We identify 10 myths, and as soon as you see them, you will recognize them as being a part and parcel of the political discussion and the, pop the popular discussion. And by appeal to evidence and logic and et cetera, et cetera, experience, we slay those myths. And so that is us as academics doing what Jennifer suggested, venturing out and talking to people outside of the university. That's my final word. I'd just like you all to join me in thanking the three panelists and um, for a great discussion. And I hope that you find that it helps to energize your lunchtime discussion, which will start 30 seconds from now after Danielle Bellon speaks.